Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is a blackjack player who calls himself Rymo. We'll be talking to Rymo in a few minutes. A friend and I had more than an hour to kill waiting for a drawing, and I suggested he bring along his 10-year-old daughter and 12-year-old son, and I'd give them some backgammon lessons. It's been decades since I played competitively, but I'm still considerably further advanced than either of them. We certainly didn't gamble, and children don't even know what the Dublin Cube is. But let's say that after we do this several more times, they want to compete and keep score. For the near future, I'd kick their butts, plain and simple. If they stay with the game, over time, it'll become more competitive. But a simple handicap system is possible, I believe, and that would allow us to compete. For example, I'm going to use units of five to bet with. These can be multiplied by whatever makes sense for you. If I received five units when I beat one kid, but lost 15 when I lost, multiplied by the cube and whether it was a single, double, or triple game, it might turn into a competitive match. Maybe losing 15 isn't the right number. Maybe it's 20, or soon 10 would be, because they're going to get better pretty fast, and I pretty much plateaued. Give me a big enough handicap, and I could challenge the world champion. This handicap will affect some decisions, it could because the reward for winning isn't the same as a penalty for losing, but it sounds like it might have potential. Now, Richard, you play backgammon. You're certainly a stronger player than I am. But if you gave me a 10 to 5 spot each game, probably we could compete evenly. What do you think of the idea in general? Um, it's I, I have in the past heard of that type of spot. No, never anywhere that huge. Um, I heard of people who were playing at, say, 11 to 10, um, where the weaker player would win 11 and the stronger player win 10. Um, I played a lot where the spot was, um, well, two, two kinds of... An uh, opening roll, maybe. Well, yeah, like I, I used to play against one particularly weak player who um, liked to gamble a lot. And um, I started off spotting him an opening 6-1, which is a really good roll. Um, then it moved up to 3-1, which is probably the best non-doubles roll. Yes. And then uh, and then it moved to double aces as his Ooh. opening roll, which is kind of ridiculous. But um, he was one of those players who would do everything in his power to make sure he never ended up winning at the end. Um, so your favorite kind of player if you're trying to make money at backhand. Um, the other possibility with the kids would be to um, to play a match, say to seven, and spot them a certain number of points. You know, like so they, they start with four, with... and you start with zero, and you're playing to seven or something like that. Uh huh. Um, two to one. Uh, I don't think I. Yeah, I don't think. I don't think I could give you two to one. I don't. Think well, agreed. Been, now, uh, if it was ten to five, I, now I'd be going. If that were the fair spot, I'd be trying to get eleven, and you'd try to only be paying me eight. I mean, that's that's part of the negotiation yeah, system yeah. that works out. And if you're trying to gamble to make money, it might not work. But if there's a lot of people who play for the fun of playing which generally wouldn't include us for the most part. But uh, and that way, to find a way to make it even might be a good idea. Yeah, and it seems like the whole game of golf seems to be about how you come up with these spots. And the guy who, what they call matching up better, uh, is the guy who ends up with the money, usually. And as in golf, in back... Uh, Backgammon, it's like in golf, you expect to get lied to on the first tee. You know, my, 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 I have a broken back and uh, whatever it is. And then, of course, the guy plays like uh, Tiger Woods. But uh, so that would do in any kind of handicap system. But oh well, let's move on. Let's talk you know to what? Our... Uh, I just wanted to mention something. The, the main yeah. event of the World Series is going on, and I've gotten a number of emails asking about our. Our guest, Sia Leda, uh -huh. uh, the woman who is going to dress up like a man to play in the main event. Um, I did email her PR rep, and uh, they said th the only thing they could point me to was her Twitter account. So um, she has tweeted a couple of times 
she claims to have been playing. I don't know if she's still in, if she was really playing, if it was all a PR stunt. But uh, that's the update. You can search See You Later on Twitter and and see what she has to say. Well, if she, if the uh, WSOP was saying they were going to try to figure out who she was, and when they did find it out, kick her out. Now, if that is true, any useful information she gives on tweeting only is going to hasten her exit. So Yeah, you know, she did post one uh, series of pictures of four people uh, and said that all looked like men and said, is, is one of these women playing at your table? Now, three of them had facial hair. So, uh, but one of them actually just looked like someone who was very androgynous. Uh And there's no way I think they could claim that she was trying to look like a man with that. She looked kind of like a young David Bowie. And if it was her, I I kind of think it was not her. Um, So if that was the look she was going with, there's no way they could throw her out for that. Well, she was, she claimed on the show that she had... uh... Her boobs were too big for that, so I don't know that that would... Uh, well, depending on what kind of clothes you wear. I suppose. Right, if you're wearing a hoodie and it's very loose and you have the hoodie up. That gives you smaller boobs. All right, let's move <laughs> on. Um, we had two separate emails from listeners suggesting that we get Rymo on the air. I'm going to make the rash assumption that those two emails were not from Rymo's mother and brother and were actually on the level. So, Rymo, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thanks for having me. Was it your mother? <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't. Not right. my mother. <laughs> now, you started using the name Rymo when you started posting on various blackjack forums. When did you start posting? Uh, why did you start posting? And what were the general subjects that interested you in posting wise um i mean i didn't start posting until after my first year of playing um and i just i I didn't even think to look for an online community for uh blackjack but um as uh as my bankroll grew and as i got more serious into it i really wanted to um just uh reach out to other people who had more experience than i did to learn from them and uh yeah I mean, I was basically fascinated from trip reports and uh, just the game itself, you know. So so how did you actually get started playing in the first place? Uh, a friend of mine was actually posting, like, pictures on Facebook, you know, chips and uh, cash. And he was, like, kind of flaunting it. And I was asking him, to, you know, are you playing poker again? And he said, no, I'm playing blackjack, um, counting cards. So that's what got me initially interested. I looked into it once before, but I just didn't take it seriously. Um, so, you know, I, I, that's how I adopted the, uh, the count that I was using. So he was using Zen count, so I just adopted that. And then I, um, from there, you know, I just started reading uh, a book or two and started learning. And, uh, but for the first, uh, for the first year, I don't think I was a winning player for about eight months. I, from January till middle of October, actually, I, I uh, lost $50 after uh, 332 hours of play. <laughs> well, it's a difference between being a losing player and, and being down $50. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, but you, you, you're not sure that you were playing. No, I, I was yeah. using really small spreads and... Um, I, I didn't have a lot of information. I wasn't on the forums, at, you know, for the first year. I didn't have software or anything. So what book were you going off? Or did you- uh, the very first one I read was Arnold Snyder's book, and then Black Belt and Blackjack. Yeah, um, and then I think after about ten months, I, I knew that I wasn't really going anywhere with it. So I knew I was doing something wrong. Um, so I started to increase my bet spreads, and I just happened to go on like a pretty good run after that. And so like I think in the last. Uh, the last uh, two and a half months of the year, I ended up uh, winning like fifteen thousand dollars, and then uh, the month after that, I, I won like another fifteen or so. I started with like three thousand, and so when my bankroll got like over thirty, that's when I started taking it more serious. So I started purchasing more books, and then that's how I got on the forums and I bought the software, and you know. So do you think that the forums definitely helped you uh, ramp up to kind of the next level of Yeah, absolutely. Competence? Yeah, well, uh, because, 
you know, uh, when you're by yourself and you have no information, it's just very difficult to, uh, uh, to really exactly know how to approach the game, you know? So. Yes. Yeah. And w- what about your friend, though, that had been posting on Facebook? I mean, did, you didn't He's ask a, him? Like, he hey. was a, No, he, it turned out he was like a really big ploppy. Oh. <laughs> um, he was really proficient at keeping like the count. I remember we used to sit at the table together and we could both uh, keep like a really accurate running count. We used to trade off the count with each other, but he just never really took it to the next step. He just um, would like place side bets. He uh, would sometimes bet into negative counts. He just never really took it to the next level. So, uh, yeah. Now you're married with kids. And so that first year where you made 15000 that's not enough to support a family on. Uh, did you have a... How did this work out? Did you inherit lots of money or what? No. So my first uh, two and a half years or so was recreational. I owned uh, some businesses, retail businesses and a service business. Um, so I had like a pretty flexible schedule. I was just playing uh, whenever I had the opportunity to. And, um, so I, I didn't start playing full time until, uh, two and a half years into my career. So two. And, and what did your wife think of all this? Um, she was actually, you know, pretty supportive. Um, uh, I did have money that I could have maybe started a bankroll with, uh, cause we had, you know, pretty large savings. Our business was successful, uh, for the quite, you know, like the first seven years. And, um, but I don't think I would have been able to convince her to, Hey babe, can I take 30 or $40,000 out of our savings to play blackjack? I think she probably would have killed me. So I started with, uh, a lower amount. I started with a few thousand dollars and I think as I started winning, you know, I'm, I'm working off of, you know, what she considered to be house money or something, you know, so now I'm playing with the casino's money, or at least that's the way she saw it. So she never, it never bothered her then, you know, do your kids think you're, um, like Superman to do this, or is this just... They're like, young, so... Uh, they have no idea. This no. is just what daddies do. Yeah. My kids thought it was boring. I mean, yeah, they don't... Uh, they liked, um, you know, when they were little, the MGM used to have a theme park behind it. Yes. So, you know, they liked going and staying at the MGM and going to the theme park and things like that, but the actual playing of blackjack was kind of... Well, they're right. It is boring. Yeah, yes. <laughs> All right. Now, we regularly have Bob Nersessian on this show. He's defended players who've been backroomed forcibly. Have you ever been backroomed like this? And did you get an attorney involved? Yeah. So, um, around 2016, I was starting to become more active and more known like in the databases and stuff. And I was getting flyered a lot. And I had one casino that I went to, and um, I had been backed off there before. Um, I went back like seven months later, and I just walk in, and you'd been backed off for eighty six. So yeah, I I was backed off, and I was actually walked out by security. At the time, you know, I was new in my career. I didn't see that as like a formal trespass. I, I thought that I had to maybe be read you know, a trespass statute or sign papers. Yeah. Well, not sign papers, but if they didn't read you the trespass act, then, uh, I, I was told a little differently, but I, so they just asked me to leave and not return. And, um, so I, I came back seven months later and when I came back, I didn't even play. Um, I walked in and I looked completely different. I was standing around. I was debating on playing. I had chips that I'd been holding onto for close to a year. And I, I was like, man, I need to either play with these or cash them or do something. I can't just keep holding on to these chips. And so I'm walking around the casino. I saw some pit bosses I had issues with in the past. So I decided not to play. I was getting ready to walk out. And that's when I get a tap on the shoulder. And uh, it's a gaming agent. He's in a suit. He says, um, yeah, I need your ID. And I said, uh, no, why do you need my ID? He goes, just, I need your ID. I need to see it said, I'm, I'm not giving you my ID. He says, well, I'm, I'm a cop. And so, because in this state, uh, gaming is state police. So I said, um, well, let me see your credentials. So he, he shows me his badge. I said, well, what do you need my ID for? He says, uh, we just need it. So I need you to show it to me. And I, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't give it up. The, then security guard comes in and he intervenes and he says, uh, yeah, you need to come to the back with us. I said, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to the back with you. 
And he says, no, you are, you don't understand. You got to, you got to come back. I said, and I asked the cop, I said, am I being arrested? Am I being detained? And if so, what's the charge? He wouldn't answer me. So I had to repeat myself two or three times like this. And I said, am I, look, am I being arrested or not? And he finally looks at the uh, security guard. He says, is he being arrested? And he goes, well, if he doesn't come to the back with us, he is. Wait, the cop asks the security? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good source of information. Yeah, there. right. So, um, I, and I said to him, I said, listen, I don't think you understand. You see that door out there. I'm walking out that door. I want to leave. I don't want to be here. I'm, I'm gone. And they kept, I kept trying to move towards the exit and they just kept blocking me. And they kept blocking me. And um, I had no AP contacts at this time except for... Uh, card counter mike you guys had him on the show a long time ago a couple of years ago a few years ago but anyway under that name <laughs> yeah <laughs> under that name well so anyway i had just met him it was really arnold snyder but he was using <laughs> yeah. card player mike so okay, i had, we just, had diamond I, mike i had just met him and one other ap for the first time they were my only two contacts at this point uh the night before and we had just uh met up for dinner earlier that evening and so i call him and i'm like uh mike i'm like what is going on? I was like, they're trying to back room me over here. Um, what should I do? Should I call someone? It's two 30 in the morning. I can't call Bob Nersessi. And I, I don't know what to do at this point. And then he, his only recollection of the, uh, of the whole situation was he just remembers me being on the phone. And then all he hears is, Hey, get off me. Get, get stop. Don't touch me. And then, and then, so I had to hang up the phone. They actually grabbed my arms and just put them behind my back. And at that point they just, they forcefully just pushed me where they wanted me to go. And so I ended up in the back room. Um, and finally, when I got back there, uh, they they said, okay, look, man, just cooperate with us and we can just get this over with. So after fighting with them, what seemed like an eternity, I finally just gave them ID, photocopied it. Security guard comes over and he throws like this big blown up photo of my face. He goes, see, this is him when he looks like when he wears a hat and he does, you know, he has a beard and blah, blah, blah. I changed up my appearance. I, the, the way they got me was just because the, through the security checkpoint with the ID scan. Uh, Cause there's no way they should have recognized me. But, um, and then, so they, they made me sign these papers. Hey, you'll never come back. If, if, if you do, you know, you'll be prosecuted. And uh, another security guard came back there. He's taking photos of me. And so I just, yeah, I was just ready to get out of there because, um, it's like two 30 in the morning. Uh, I'm in like a really bad neighborhood. Um, uh, I've got maybe like low five figures on me. It's, I don't want to go to jail <laughs> at this point. So I finally just signed everything and I was like, well, listen, if you're going to not let me back, I need to cash these chips. And that was a big ordeal. Cause I didn't want to give them the chips. I wanted them to escort me to the cage and they refused to do that. And so we kind of went back and forth and finally they just made me put it on the security desk, surveillance verified it. And they, when they walked me out of the room, eventually the security guard went in, cashed it out for me. And then they escorted me off the premises and that was it. So, but it was scary, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Did you call a lawyer? I did. I, I spoke with uh, Bob Nersessian briefly and Bob Loeb. Um, and the only issue was that in the past, they had asked me to leave and not return. They never actually said, if you come back, we'll, you'll have you arrested. They never made me sign anything. They didn't read any kind of trespass statute. But um, Bob Loeb sounded a little bit more, you know... A little bit more optimistic than maybe Nersessian did. I think he was like, we could maybe get a settlement. We could. Um, but with the amount of time involved, you didn't spend a whole lot of time in the back room. It's not like I was there for hours. Um, so the, the the cost that would be involved and, you know, you would be well known. It just might not be worth it. So I just kind of dropped it then. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that whole you would be well known idea is something people should not worry about at all in the least i mean james grossgene plays 325 days a year if not more and he's about as well known as you could possibly get by <laughs> every database every gaming commission right you know so yeah and tommy highlands too i mean has been playing for 40 years everybody knows who he is he still plays he said he he can still play more hours than he cares to play so all right and so uh bob Loeb is based in chicago and nersessian is based in las vegas i assume it was somewhere in the middle yeah <laughs> all right that narrows it down at least it 
It wasn't in uh, Florida. Okay, good. <laughs> and um, it wasn't an Indian casino. That's right. The other. Uh, if it was an Indian casino, you you just screw. It. Yeah. <laughs> You sent notes to us on an incident that sounded like one of my senior moments. Now, today you're considerably younger than me, but with any luck, your day will come. You were 86 from a casino, and you couldn't find your car. Um, Tell us about that. Yeah. So I uh, I was on a trip, a four, five, six-day trip, and I went out to this casino I was also new into my career at this time. I was still playing recreationally. I think I may have played rated. I got a little bit of time in the night before. The next morning, I went back, played for an hour. I went up to go to the, use the restroom, and standing behind me is uh, security and uh, the shift manager or casino manager, or someone. And they pulled me off to the side. They give me the spiel. You know, hey, um, we're a private business. We have the right to reserve uh, reserve the right to uh, refuse anyone's uh, business. And we're going to exercise that right now. Um, you're being banned from the property permanently. We don't want you back here. You need to cash out and leave. So no big deal. I end up cashing out. I start to leave. And I was talking to my wife on my phone. And I was like, yeah, I just got 86 from this property. I'm going to start heading back towards home. I was going to hit another city on the way home and stay the night there. And so I'm talking to her and I can't find my car. And so I'm looking. Is it your car or a rental car? No, it was my car. Um, I look on the third level and I can't find it. And I go on the fourth level, can't find it. So I go down to the second level, can't find it. And I start like looking around to look at um, any uh, to see what the scenery looked like to, cause I remember what I saw on my way in and I'm telling my wife, uh, babe, I'm kind of worried. I just got 86 here. I can't find my vehicle. Let me let you go. And so I can figure this out. Um, so she gets on my, uh, find my app, uh, you know, or, or find my iPhone app. And she sends me a screenshot where it shows that my location is at the casino, but it shows that my iPad, which is in the trunk of my car, is like across the river, a few miles away, up on another in another state, basically, because we're on the border. Okay. Wow. And <laughs> and so I immediately freak out because all my stuff is in there. I have like half of my trip roll in there I, at the time, which wasn't much. I think I had twelve or thirteen thousand dollars in there, and. Uh, all my clothes, my belongings, my iPad, because my iPad has like its own, you know, uh, internet service. It has uh, sure. like, this SIM card in it. So I immediately just start freaking out because I'm like, why is my iPad in a different location than I am? Um, so I'm, you know, I go into the casino. I'm like, man, maybe this is a trap. Maybe they're trying to, you know, find a reason to arrest me. I, I, you know, I'm really naive at this point. I'm new. So like I have all these weird thoughts are going through my head. And I say, hey, do you know anything about my car? Did it get towed? I thought maybe they towed my vehicle just to kind of mess with me. I don't know what happened. And um, so they said, no, we, if, we, if it would have been towed, we would have known something. So I call the police and I'm in the parking garage. They come out and I'm, I'm, I keep refreshing the, the page to show where my car is. And I'm taking screenshots of it just in case like the signal drops off or something. And I'm showing the police. I'm like, listen, my car was here. And, and you know, uh, so they start sending out like a patrol vehicle to go to the location where the, uh, the signal's coming from, from my iPad. And they can't find anything. Um, and then, you know, I, I need to use the restroom really bad at this point. And I'm, you know, it's awkward because I just got 86 there. And I had to have security escort me back inside so I can use the restroom. And I'm with the police probably for 20, 25 minutes or something. I, it felt really long. Um, and eventually uh, the security guard says, well, let me run the tapes and let me see what I can find. I said, okay. Um, he comes back about 10, 15 minutes later and he says, hey, or were you driving such and such vehicle? He describes like the, uh, the color, the make and the model. And I said, yeah, that's it. He goes, I think your car's still here in the parking lot. I said, what? <laughs> and I think no more than a hundred feet from where we were standing the whole time <laughs> by the patrol car. My car is right there. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, oh my God. Man. So I go over to the car. I said, well, maybe, Maybe somebody stole something out of my car. Maybe they took my bag. Maybe that's why the signal, because I keep refreshing the signal and it still shows that my iPad is across the river 
bordering this other, you know, on this other state. And I'm like, I go into the trunk and there's my bag. I go in my bag. There's my bankroll. And I go in and there's my iPad. And I look at the cop and (laughs) and I'm like, I am so sorry. And he was just like, I'm glad we got it worked out. But you could just tell by the the look on his face. (laughs) He hated me. And this is the one time technology really failed me. Um, I don't know why it showed the signal was in a complete, like few miles away. And so the only thing I could think of was that maybe when I was driving in, um, the signal pinged off of one of the towers or something. And it just kind of stayed like that. Um, but it was a really embarrassing back off and a memorable, memorable one for myself and them. So, yeah. Um, yeah, be a long time before you could go back to that place. I'm sure. Yeah, they have a pretty good fixation about who you are. <laughs> yeah, I and I did actually go back again. Uh, I like a year later. They, Some guys are not quick learners. No. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I was new. <laughs> I was still, uh, you know, pretty green at the time. Um, they all they did was re eighty six me again, and they were like, "Hey, do you remember back on this date?" And this time you were asked by this shift manager to leave and not return. I was like, I don't recall. And he said, well, because it's been so long, we're going to just remind you again. But, you know, if you do come back, you will be arrested next time. And so and that was the end of that. But so I uh, my partner, uh, Daryl, um, one time lost three cars in the period of two weeks in Atlantic City and. Um, He's he is much more responsible these days. I'll just say that for him because he he always he only likes loses to point two out, and three you know, weeks I was now. twenty two years old or whatever. But yeah, in Atlantic City, he lost three cars. One the only one story I remember was he uh, it was winter and very cold, and he pulled up to resorts, and he was just he just pulled up in front, left the car running, and he was just going to run inside to check a particular game and then run back out. And he ran inside, and there was a particular dealer on that he wanted to play. And he sat down and just started playing. And six hours later, he couldn't remember where his car was. And apparently the, you know, uh, valet or something had just uh, gone and parked his car. But uh, he had no idea. I think he ended up calling the police. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, he lost three in, in, in a two-week period. So, so um, you're not the only one. That's good to hear. Yeah, so that is a... Uh... You're on the way to making the Blackjack Hall of Fame. I mean, clearly, <laughs> that, this is what it takes. <laughs> All right, we're talking to Raimo. We're going to take a brief break uh, for some commercials, and then we'll be back. The South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In July, Chevron and Walmart cards may be earned at 8,334 points, which is a point six rate which is twice the normal rate um limit of 10 for the month so for the basically for the first eighty three thousand dollars coin in you play for the month you're getting double points which is 0.6 at that casino six times points at at others uh since eighty three thousand is more than many players play effectively double points all month the third class in the free video poker series will be tuesday july 17th at noon in the Silverado Lounge. The class is Super Double Bonus. This game is like Double Bonus, except that four jacks, queens, and kings pay 600 coins instead of 250. The other pay schedule categories are reduced accordingly. The 9-5 version we teach returns 99.695% with appropriate play, making it basically an even game 24-7 with the .30 slot club, Plus, mailers and promotion make it slightly positive. This month's promotion gives you a 0.3% advantage. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on many of the games. The game of the week is Ultimate X Wheel Poker, which is the latest offering in the Ultimate X franchise in this game you bet 10 coins per line and are awarded bonuses uh, this hand to be play off on the next hand which is a feature in all ultimate x games the difference is that instead of getting 12x being the multiplier you earn for a full house as you do in regular ultimate x 
you spin a wheel. On the wheel are amounts of coins, 250, 500, 1,000, or 2,000, and several slots giving you big multipliers on the next hand, between 14x and 20x. Uh, as in regular Ultimate X, induces wild variation. It's the straight flush that triggers the big bonus rather than the full house. All right, we're back talking to Rymo. What is the Discord channel? Um, Discord is a text and voice chat application, um, and it can be used uh, through PC, um, Mac, smartphone, tablet. Uh, I think it was originally designed for the gaming community, um, but it's it really it's a pretty cool social platform that could be used by anyone. So uh, it's just like an ongoing chat room. And the cool features that they have is um, you have the ability to do like a voice chat through like a voice over IP type service, you know. So you can have as many people, you know, in the chat room that all want to hop into a voice conversation, uh, which is pretty cool. And um, you can send people private messages. So it's not like a forum, you know, it's, you know, what makes it different is it's just an ongoing chat. So and the chats can have uh, many different channels. Mm -hmm. So, so if people want to talk about, say, video poker, there'd be a separate channel for that. And if somebody else wants to talk about blackjack, they can have a separate channel for that. But yeah, it started with gaming. So, like, if you play uh, Overwatch or something like that, you know, you can talk with your teammates while you're while you're playing the game. That kind of gaming. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not casino gaming. Yeah. Now, Although that would be cool to see guys at blackjack tables wearing headsets. <laughs> you know. And talking out loud. Yeah. You can sure read the yeah. cult cards on this table. Come on by. <laughs> the um, So the particular forum on, well, particular channel on the Discord channel on blackjack is this one that you've set up for the black is set up by somebody else how do people get on it yeah so i um i was a part of a couple other channels that were designed for the purpose of ap discussion but uh the information on those channels were just terrible so i decided to start my own channel um and i've i've created uh, a, a bunch of other little sub channels so if you want to talk about uh, blackjack, you know, a lot of people will discuss that in like the general chat room. Or if you want to talk about video poker, there's a video poker chat. If you want to talk about sports, there's a sports chat. Um, and I put like a lot of resources there for newer players. Cause a lot of the guys that were originally joining were, uh, new players to the community. So I put a bunch of free resources, uh, that would just kind of point them in the right direction. So, you know, Hey, if you want to read, uh, books. These are a list of good books to read. Or if you want to join a forum, these are the the list of forums that I've participated in. Or if you're looking for software to run simulations, uh, these are the good softwares to go out and purchase. So I would just kind of point people in the right direction. Um, so it, it there's a lot of people on there that just kind of chat, ver you know, about various different types of uh, AP. It started off with blackjack, but now it's kind of developed into something more. But if people want to get on, though, um, I did set up like a site. Because it, it was like an invite only link, and it's it was pretty tough to kind of get people on there. Uh, you, you have to send people private messages with links to get onto the channel. So I I got like a domain name. I got like a little free site. It's called uh, blackjackdiscord.com. All they have to do is just go on there, and there's a link that'll just take them straight into the channel if they want to participate. So one of the um, concerns that players have, I mean. Uh, this is kind of going on for 20 years or something now where originally uh, Wong and Arnold Snyder had websites where they had chat rooms. And, and these are actually really beneficial to players sometimes. You're right. There's a lot of sort of just nonsense talk uh, on there. But occasionally there's really good information, especially for newer players trying to learn something. But the big concern was always... You know, in the early days, the Griffin agent would get on there or, um, you know, surveillance people would get on there. I mean, this always ha ends up happening because it's hard to keep these things secure. So um, how do you deal with that? And, and how many people are on there? Uh, how many subscribers or whatever do you have? Um, I've seen like we, we have like a few hundred 
people on there that are um, that are registered to that channel. Not a lot of them are all active, though. Um, as far as privacy, I tell everyone to just treat it like you would any other open AP forum. I say, don't use your real name. Don't discuss specific locations. Uh, don't use any real emails. Uh, just be smart about it, you know? Um, and then we've also set like private chats. There's ways of, you know, within the channel that you can set private, um, chat areas to where, um, if we've gotten to know someone over the course of the last year or two, or if we've been corresponding with them, uh, through the forums, like through Blackjack the Forum or BJ21, Blackjack Apprenticeship, whatever. Um, if I know them, then uh, it's possible to have more private conversations as well. Uh, so there's no need to worry about any surveillance or anyone lurking in there. So, um, so yeah, uh, but just treat it like an open forum, though. So, um, I, I want to go back to um, something we touched on earlier, which is family life. How much are you on the road, and and how is that going with your family? Um, you know, it's always been. Uh, it my wife has been pretty supportive throughout this whole thing. Um, I will typically get five hundred hours in a year uh, of play, and I just try to keep the trips like maybe three to five days. Sometimes I'll go as long as like a week, but. Um, she's pretty understanding. Uh, she's never really, uh, you know, uh, been fixated on the results, uh, too much. I remember, uh, the trip. So the trip where I had was 86 and lost the car. I was driving home and I started that trip off really well. And I think on my last day or two, I dumped like 10 grand or something. And I, it put me in the hole, uh, a little bit. And, at the time I was really new to playing. So, I mean, that was a big swing for me at that time. And I just remember I was just kind of, you know, uh, bitching and moaning to my wife. I was like, man, you know, I started off really well and, uh, you know, I just had a really bad swing the last couple of days. And then she says to me, well, at least you got that EV, right? Wow. wow. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. So and she goes, that's what you wanted, right? You're, you you wanted to get EV. And I said, yeah, yeah, I did. And I, and I got a bunch of hours in on that trip. I said, yeah. So that's great. But yeah. I mean, for me, it was always, I, it might've been harder on me just because I didn't want to be gone because of my kids, I don't want to, I didn't want to miss their soccer games, I, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. How many trips per month? would you say you make it depends on um if it's somewhere that i can go close by within four or five hours you know i might make a few of those if it you know if i'm traveling further out i'll make it a longer trip so i'll take less of those i mean it, it just varies i mean like the, you know uh, this year i had um you know one trip where uh, i've had like months where i've maybe only done like 25 hours but then you know last month i did you know close to 100 hours so it just it varies it's just whenever it's convenient um and i just try to keep a certain pace and just keep up with it so uh but yeah it is hard though being away from the wife and kids so i mean eventually i want to transition you know out of full-time play um because yeah it is difficult being away all the time i definitely think you know it can put some strain on a relationship and you know you miss out on things with your children so uh, it, it's definitely a little bit harder like that. So, and uh, without, I, I, I'm not trying to ask what you earn, but um, if you if you um, play 500 hours a year, uh, you kind of have to have at least $200 an hour EV to have a, to make a reasonable income, and you're able to find that you're still able to generate that kind of EV just counting cards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the games that I was playing this year, last year was generating 200 to 300 an hour. Some games, I mean, if it's a really good game, you know, four or $500 an hour. So it just depends, you know, if you're finding like a really good double deck game, or, you know, high tolerance and decent cuts. I mean, you know, you can easily make $500 an hour or, or more. Yeah, so games still exist. <laughs> they, yeah. I mean, and you know what? It's funny because there's, you know, there's just places out in the middle of nowhere that you would just never expect to, to take the action. It's the places that you le the least expect sometimes. Um, you know, I, no, I agree. The so. big places that get tons of action, like, you know, the win or the Venetian. Yeah. You're going to get nothing, but yeah, it's some place in the middle of nowhere that there have been times where I, I sat down and, and I'm just thinking, I'll be lucky if I get 45 minutes here 
And then all of a sudden it's like 10 hours later and, you know, I'm up like five figures and I'm like, how am I still here? And, you know, so uh, it's super aggressive and everything. But uh, I just I don't know if some places just don't know how to do the evaluation or maybe if they see that you're betting a little bit larger, they don't want to back you off as quickly. I don't I don't know. Yeah, no, it does seem that the more you bet, the less heat you get. Um, Yeah. But uh is that your approach? Like the no cover, put it in their face, just spread until they throw you out? Pretty much. Uh, that's I've always been pretty aggressive in terms of like bet spreads. And then as time went on, I even, you know, would just get more aggressive. I split tens and, you know, I would just maybe, you know, if I was on like a $500 max game, I might be betting $10 a hand and then go to two hands a table max or something. I just, you know. <laughs> put it in their face yeah <laughs> just um that's all you know that's always been kind of my approach um and uh, surprisingly sometimes they'll let you do that for quite a while and sometimes it doesn't last more than a few minutes but you know it's just how it is so you don't know until you know exactly now you must have been backed off hundreds of times yeah uh, now other than the um, incidents you've already talked about today have there been any interesting back offs um, yeah, I mean, most of them have always been pretty polite. Uh, they're usually very just cordial, like, hey, no, no more action. And then you just walk out. Um, I've had a couple nasty ones. I, I would say, I think I've had maybe 130, 140 plus back offs or something, but, um, maybe a handful of 86s. I, I remember I had, uh, one in town here um, that was a pretty nasty. They, I remember I was in the middle of playing and I was in the middle of a hand and uh, they, you know, I got surrounded by security and they wouldn't let me finish the round. And I actually had like a blackjack on one hand. And uh, so I had a winning hand and they wouldn't, they refused to finish the round. Um, wow. Did you call it gaming? So... I threatened to call gaming. The problem was I was playing on a, on an alias. Um, so I was, you know, worried that they might, uh, try to, you know, gaming might get my real name. And then, cause I, I was playing on a completely different name. And, um, so they refused to pay it out. And, um, they said, uh, not only, you know, are you, you're not going to cash these chips unless you, uh, show us ID, but, uh, you forfeit the chips that are on the table. And so, I said, are you kidding me? I said, just, just finish the round. Let's just, you know, let me get out of here. And they, they refused. So I, I made the mistake. I, I just grabbed the chips off the table. Hey. Yeah. I did, you know, heat of the moment. And I, and he's like, you know, you, you're going to get arrested. And, and so he was like shoving his shoulder into me, trying to, <laughs> trying to maybe provoke me. Um, and they're just extremely aggressive. Um, and, I think I, I called Bob about it just because I, I was I more concerned about myself to, you know, could I get in trouble for grabbing the chips, despite the fact that it was a winning hand um, and they should have completed the round. They didn't. So well, it was a winning hand on one of them. On one of them. Had, yeah. You yeah. had multiple spots. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, <laughs> funny thing was Bob called me back and he called me when I was sleeping. It was like in the day and. I picked up the phone and I don't re- remember the call at all. My friend had to wake me up and he's like, you know, you're on the phone, right? <laughs> and I, Bob sounded really confused and maybe a little upset because I, I, I didn't make any sense when I was talking. I was, I was still like asleep, but, uh, yeah, I wasn't looking to get like any kind of like settlement or anything. I, I just, I was curious, you know, did I do something wrong here? And you know, what, what could the consequences be? So I haven't played any of these, their properties in this area since that incident, but um yeah i got chased out and uh, multiple properties sounds like stations or harris <laughs> or mgm or, yes. or boyd or i mean there's lots of uh, yeah there are yeah there are <clears throat> so did he say I you mean, had any there's liability? nothing wrong with playing under a different name right as long as you didn't have a fake id right so. yeah um I, I think i was well i was staying uh, at a sister property uh really close by um and so my main concern and i was in a comp room but i was not playing at that property and um uh, my main concern was if they get my real name they might 
realize that I'm staying next door and then, you know, you get evicted. So, and then they might deactivate my card. And so I, it just wasn't worth it. You know, I mean, I didn't want to, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to take it. So what is your approach to using a player's card or playing anonymous? Now I don't use player's cards. Every once in a while, if there's a property that I know and like through networking where they say, listen, it doesn't matter if you're in OSN or Biometric, you could play here, no issues. But aside from that, I don't even chance it most of the time um, because it just causes problems. I mean, every time, you know, I you try so hard to – the CTRing is like the big issue, you know. And so every time I've ever CTR'd, the moment you give up your information, 30 minutes later, you're getting backed off. And so – yeah, I used to play rated a lot in the beginning, which is what landed me in, you know, all the databases and everything. But now it's just I just don't think it's worth it. So don't stay at the property. And yeah, <laughs> lesson learned. Right. What about long losing streaks? Those are always a lot of fun. Have you been through that? Yeah. Um, last year I had one that was uh, 300 hours. Wow, that's a bad one. Yeah, um, I – let me see. So, And you're only playing 50 hours a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's it, six months, seven months? No, this one lasted um, – it started like second week of March, and I didn't fully climb out of it until I think first week of November or something. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, but your wife was proud of the EV you got, so everything was fine. <laughs> right. Well, hey, when you added it up at the end of the year, he was still ahead. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it still actually turned out to be a pretty good year. Uh, I had a really huge upswing at the very end of the year. But um, I, I was from top to bottom, 150 hours into it, 150.49. It looks like I I'd lost $44,759. And then... It took me uh, almost another 150 to get it all back. So that was that was really frustrating. You know, just uh, you felt like you're uh, just spinning your wheels, you know, nonstop. Well, we had uh, Yoshi on the show, and he once lost for four hours. So, <laughs> yeah. so he's had it rough too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, and then uh, this year I'm just, uh, in the middle of another big one now, and it, it's really annoying. Uh, I'm down a little bit more, and I'm 150 hours into it, so um, I'll, I'll be surprised if it, you know, if it, this lasts any less than 300 or so hours, so. Brutal. Now, gambling full-time or quarter time if, if 500 hours is quarter time whatever it is what kind of highs and lows emotionally um do you find this happens so yeah i mean uh i there's definitely a lot of um uh I'll, so i'll talk about a recent trip i guess because uh the reality is is a lot, a lot of the new people that are on my discord they all just think okay let me get a bankroll and let me start playing and problem solved you know and that's it uh and there's so many other obstacles that people don't think about um there's you know obviously great trips and then you have uh, i had a recent trip where i uh was on the road it was supposed to be like two days long and it turns out to be a week long trip i end up driving uh five hours six hours away from home and i play uh for one day did well. Then the next day I end up uh, CTRing and then I was told I'd be flyer throughout the whole state and parts of another state. I said, okay, so now I drive to another state. So now I'm, I have to get back on the road another two and a half hours and I'm in another place and every day I'm dumping like 10,000 one day and then 12,000 the next day. And it's just like, it doesn't seem to end. And, uh, uh, I ended up, you know, at one point I ran out of cash, but I had like another $25,000 in chips. But the dilemma that I was in, um, I had $10,000 in chips from one casino in three hours in one direction. And I had like another $7,000 in chips in, uh, in a casino that was two and a half hours north of me. And then I had another like $8,000 in chips at a casino that was seven, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, two hours south of me. And so 
the nearest bank is for my branch is 170 miles away from what I understand. And so I had like maybe close to 30 K with me and I I'm close to tapped out and I have all these chips, but I have to go in all these separate directions. So I'm like, what am I going to do here? So I I'm calling my bank trying to figure out, okay, how much, what's the most I can take out of an ATM or, you know, what? Or, and so I found out that I can go to the cage and I can, uh, purchase up to $7,500 for like a 2% fee. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to pay, I think I, it had to be like 7,300, uh, and then plus the cost of the fee. And I'm thinking, okay, um, I can either pay the $150 for this fee, or I have to get back on the road for another three hours. So what's going to cost me more in time and gas and everything. So I, I have to do this like twice over the course of the next two days while I'm taking money out of an ATM. As a matter of fact, I was in the middle of a hand. I'm in the middle of a shoe and I, I had not run out of cash at that point, but I was starting to get close and I was in max bet situation. So I was like, you know what? I know how this can turn out. I had to stop the table and luckily I was the only one there, but I threw cash on the table. They laid it out and they're just the whole game is stopped. I had to run to the cage. I'm calling my bank. I'm on the hold with them for 15 minutes while I'm trying to keep, you know, uh, track of the count in my head the whole time and just make sure I don't drop the count while I'm, you know, on hold for 15 minutes. Finally, they approved it because they, they, it was a fraud alert. They're like, yeah, we saw that you tried taking $6,000 out of your account. I was like, actually, what's my limit? They're like, uh, 7,500. Okay. I need all that. <laughs> and, then, and so, and I actually, when I finally got it, I ended up needing it all because I ended up losing all the rest of the cash that I had. And I ended up making a comeback after that. But, um, you know, casino must have loved it. You look like the oh, biggest degenerate in the world. I did. Yeah. Um, and so and then finally, I ended up leaving this place because uh, I, I had to start making my way home. But I had to drive north and turn around. I had to go cash out these chips in another area. And. You know, I played till like four or five o'clock in the morning. The casino closed. The table games closed for a few hours. It wasn't convenient. I had to sleep in my car for a few hours and then start drive. And now I'm like nine or 10 hours away from home. So I have to, as I'm driving back, I hit up an, another casino and then they end up, um, they ended up, uh, backing me off and I lose a bunch there. So it was just like almost everything, you know, it's like Murphy's law, right? If it can go wrong, it will. Go wrong. It sounds like the glitter and glamour of the life of a professional gambler. <laughs> yeah, I remember not quite the same incident, but I was playing at um, the Reserve, which is where Fiesta Henderson is now. And the game they had was a very good $2 five play game, which is $50 a hand. And it was super double bonus which is a pretty high volatile game but it was significantly positive ev and i had run out of cash on hand now i lived five miles away at the time or something and there was there were funds at the house but i going five miles away and getting it back was more than i wanted to do at that time so i the cage, the reserve did not allow you to have markers. But they went up, and since I was a known player, they would let me borrow $200 if I wanted to. <laughs> and I go, $200? i am playing $50 a hand. I've lost $12,000 in the past hour and a half. I need more than $200. And they go, $200 is our limit. That's gone. Thank you very much. So I cashed out. And I had more money at home, but after I got home, it was like, screw it. Didn't yeah. want to go back. But you know, that's it, where having a network is so important, right? If you yeah. have friends who I would I would think by now you must know people in all those states and yeah. be able to call them and say, hey, you know, do you have any cash? I, <laughs> yeah, I but for me, I, I had no, money yeah. five miles away. Yeah, right. So it was, it was yeah. not as though I, uh, I needed to call... You up, you were not an active part of my life at that point, and say, you know, can I borrow some? I, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I didn't know just... anyone in that area at the time. Uh, well, I still don't know anyone in that particular. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So I just, <laughs> yeah, that's how uh, it goes, though, you know. All right. This is an enjoyable episode. We've been talking to Raimo. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. You still don't want that 10 to 5 spot, huh? No, yeah. I'll pass uh, on that. In that case, I'm going to wish everybody uh, lots of royal flushes next week. 
Good day.